some of the uh, environmental uh, changes uh, that we're uh, seeing and uh, how these might be uh, affecting some of the uh, uh, cultural practices uh, that we do. So we talked about it a little bit uh, yesterday uh, at the uh, biochemistry uh, session. We talked about uh, some of the uh, changes uh, we're seeing uh, <clears throat> as a result of some of the uh, canopy management practices. And these practices are uh, needed. Okay, So these practices that are needed are uh, dormant pruning and then uh, what we uh, collectively uh, call as uh, green pruning, such as shoot removal, leaf removal, which we will uh, talk about, uh, you know, rest of the, uh, you know, week. Uh, they do have some, uh, you know, benefits to the uh, plant health, fitness, and of course uh, they do have benefits as far as uh, flavonoids and uh, sun exposure goes. Oh, I should stand by the uh, thing. Uh, shaded cluster with a light exposure cluster. This uh, work has, uh, you know, been uh, done over and over that, uh, you know, we do see an uh, increase in our uh, total anthocyanins with uh, leaf removal, but they do, uh, you know, slowly uh, decline uh, as the uh, season wears on. So we do try to uh, maintain a, you know, known amount of uh, exposed uh, leaf area, and the uh, main purpose of, uh, you know, having the uh, leaf area is to uh, fix carbon and uh, assimilate this carbon to aid in our ripening and then uh, to uh, generate some of these uh, yield precursors. The uh, microclimate of the uh, canopy has a direct effect on the uh, fruit composition. And uh, as we talked about uh, yesterday, some of these practices uh, also aid in uh, you know, our plant protection, especially from uh, fungal infection uh, incidents. The irrigation requirements, as, do our, uh, as they're uh, changing uh, dynamically as we're uh, facing these uh, you know, uh, different uh, climate scenarios, they do affect uh, uh, the amount of uh, leaf area and they do affect uh, transpiration and uh, evapotranspiration and uh, evapotranspiration, as uh, uh, Andrew uh, mentioned uh, yesterday. So solar radiation is uh, what's driving uh, uh, evapotranspiration. So this data is from uh, uh, Madera, California. Uh, this uh, is from uh, Dr. L. Williams' uh, 2000 uh, paper. The x-axis is uh, time of day in our hours, going from uh, zero to uh, 24 hours. And the y-axis is uh, net radiation. Uh, the net radiation is the uh, you know, uh, solid line, and the uh, uh, dashed line is the uh, ambient temperature. And uh, as solar radiation uh, increases, this is also uh, you know, uh, changing the uh, evapotranspiration of uh, the uh, plant, as uh, reported here in our uh, gallons per hour. So at its uh, peak, is, uh, where uh, the uh, vine is uh, uh, transpiring about uh, one and a half gallons of uh, water per hour. And the uh, water use declines with a uh, depletion in the uh, soil uh, profile. So this is a uh, soil water content in uh, all depths going from uh, you know, 10 to uh, 30. This is the uh, ratio of uh, reference evapotranspiration to uh, crop evapotranspiration. So you can see that uh, this is uh, uh, increasing uh, linearly the soil water, as soil water content uh, increases the ratio of uh, reference evapotranspiration to uh, crop evapotranspiration increases uh, linearly. Conversely, when you look at the uh, portions of uh, uh, evapotranspiration uh, applied at uh, you know, 40%, 80%, or a non-stressed vine at 120%, you see that uh, as the uh, day of uh, year uh, increases, the midday uh, leaf water uh, potential uh, will uh, decrease as you change the uh, applied uh, water amounts, and uh, the uh, water use uh, will uh, decline as the uh, you know, soil uh, water profile is uh, depleted. And this uh, deficit affects the uh, grapevine uh, physiology. So this is one from one of the uh, you know, uh, textbooks uh, you know, that uh, uh, students uh, use to uh, study uh, plant physiology. The yeah, x-axis uh, water potential going from uh, zero to uh, negative four uh, megapascals. Well-watered plants uh, will usually have a uh, water potential of about, uh, you know, between uh, zero to uh, negative one, usually about a uh, negative uh, three is uh, what we uh, assume is a non-stressed plant. Plants under uh, transient or uh, mild water uh, stress are going to be between uh, negative one to uh, negative two. 
in uh, plants in uh, arid and uh, desert climates will be between uh, negative 2 to uh, negative 4 uh, water potential. So as we, uh, you know, uh, as Ashraf uh, talked about it uh, yesterday, the abscisic acid uh, accumulation uh, will uh, increase as our uh, water potential uh, decreases, and also our uh, solute uh, accumulation uh, will also increase. Uh, conversely, uh, net photosynthesis uh, will, uh, <coughs> uh, will uh, uh, decrease as our water potential uh, uh, increases, and so does our stomatal uh, conductance, protein synthesis, wall synthesis uh, in the uh, grape berries, and uh, cell expansion is uh, also uh, impeded as our water stress uh, you know, uh, increases uh, you know, as a general uh, in the plants. So as this uh, plant is uh, getting warmer, and so are our uh, viticulture regions, so we plotted these uh, uh, all across uh, California. Um, so since we're uh, up in the uh, north coast, I'll uh, you know, just focus on uh, Napa. The, ca the temperature in uh, Napa has uh, you know, uh, consistently uh, increased. And the uh, growing degree days uh, uh, collectively has uh, also uh, increased as the uh, you know, uh, decades uh, went on. When the Winkler uh, Index uh, was uh, first proposed, uh, you know, this region that we're standing on was, uh, you know, low uh, region two. Right now, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, somewhat of, uh, you know, a warm uh, region three in uh, Napa. But keep in mind that, uh, you know, uh, vintages are, uh, you know, related to, uh, you know, accumulation of uh, proper number of uh, growing degree days. The worst vintage uh, ever, according to uh, Wine Spectator, was in uh, 1978 in uh, Napa. And, uh, you know, this was the, uh, you know, lowest uh, growing degree days uh, accumulated uh, in this uh, region as well. So, is heat, you know, the uh, more the uh, better? We talked about it a little bit uh, yesterday. You know, as, you know, there has to be a balance between, uh, you know, sugar and the alcohol production and some uh, relationship to uh, acidity. But, uh, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, degrading these uh, polyphenols that has uh, made this, uh, you know, uh, region or uh, California, you know, a uh, player in the uh, world stage. So we do have this uh, anthocyanin loss during uh, hang time at, uh, you know, three locations in uh, California. So we went around the state, uh, and uh, I won't mention, uh, you know, where the exact uh, vineyards are, so I'll say, uh, you know, Central Valley, Napa, and uh, Sonoma. The x-axis is uh, total soluble solids in all plots. The y-axis uh, milligrams of uh, anthocyanins or of uh, berry uh, fresh mass. Uh, there's a relationship between uh, you know total soluble solids uh, accumulation and uh, anthocyanin uh, biosynthesis content and uh, concentration. Doesn't matter uh, how you uh, you know express it uh, in this case. Uh, in this uh, exercise uh, over uh, three years, we plotted the uh, raw accumulation of a uh, biosynthesis of uh, anthocyanin and uh, total soluble uh, solids. And then uh, we corrected this to uh, achieve 12% uh, alcohol in the uh, fresh wine. So it's a uh, you know, statistical uh, exercise, how you, how you would get uh, you know, 12% uh, alcohol from this much uh, sugar you produced. So in the Central Valley, Napa and uh, Sonoma, doesn't matter, you know, per acre, per hectare, you will uh, produce the uh, same amount of uh, anthocyanins uh, you know, it, for any given uh, acre of land, depending on uh, what time of the uh, year uh, you decide to uh, measure this. In Central Valley, we reach a peak of uh, anthocyanins uh, right around uh, 20 bricks, after which point on, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the raw data, it'll uh, decline to about uh, 50%. But if I uh, adjust this to 12% uh, uh, alcohol, this will decline to about 63% uh, of uh, what it was at uh, 20 uh, bricks. Conversely, in Napa, we will reach a peak anthocyanin uh, right around uh, 23 uh, bricks, and the uh, de de depletion or uh, degradation in Napa is, uh, you know, less compared to, uh, you know, uh, Central Valley. Uh, raw data, we only lose about, uh, you know, 8% of our total anthocyanins. If I adjust it to 12% uh, alcohol, uh, it only uh, goes down about 17% uh, uh, degradation. Sonoma is, uh, you know, uh, quite an uh, interesting place. This was in, uh, you know, Dry Creek uh, area. Uh, the relationship is uh, almost uh, cubic uh, here. Uh, we reach a peak uh, very similar to uh, uh, Napa at uh, 23 uh, bricks, but uh, it's a little bit uh, warmer in uh, Sonoma, or it has gotten uh, warmer in uh, 
Sonoma over the years, we lose about uh, 10 percent of the uh, raw anthocyanins, but uh, whenever uh, I adjust it to a uh, 12 percent uh, uh, alcohol in the uh, finished wine, we will lose about uh, 25 percent of the uh, anthocyanins in uh, uh, Sonoma. So I guess the uh, take-home message I'm trying to uh, give uh, here is like when we uh, you know looked at these uh, plots uh, over uh, three years with these uh, you know uh, elevated uh, amount of uh, growing degree days that we accumulate. Hanging these uh, fruit uh, post uh, 24 to uh, 25 bricks in these uh, hot uh, 100 plus degree uh, you know temperatures uh, might not be uh, helping the uh, bottom line uh, you know uh, that much because you know uh, sugar has to be uh, adjusted somehow by uh, addition of uh, water or uh, something so we're ending up with a more uh, diluted uh, wine uh, in the uh, long long run but wine grape quality is a uh, very extremely uh, you know, complex uh, topic in this case. It's subjective and it changes uh, gradually uh, over the uh, years. There are hundreds of uh, chemical compounds. You know, we have a wonderful lab at uh, Oakville. Uh, you know, we monitor about 160 different compounds, but it's almost uh, impossible to give a relative uh, importance to uh, each. Because, uh, you know, every uh, winemaker or uh, grower is, uh, you know, after uh, something else. So everyone has their uh, special sauce to uh, say. And uh, usually aspects uh, not related to uh, grape quality uh, determining uh, wine price, you know, comes into play uh, in these things. A market niche and uh, how much uh, invested in uh, winemaking is uh, affecting these uh, decisions of uh, pricing and uh, how does uh, climate change uh, might be affecting these uh, quality parameters in the long run. But in the end, uh, nobody uh, likes these uh, sour grapes. Uh, it becomes uh, very difficult to market. Because a uh, vintage failure is very strongly associated to uh, reaching a certain amount of uh, sugar, a sh sugar level. So I got these uh, values from uh, Bordeaux, their uh, vintage quality uh, index that the uh, co-op uh, puts out. The uh, x-axis is uh, 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 Cabernet or uh, Merlot uh, mean sugar in uh, grams per liter. You would multiply this by uh, 0.1 to get to uh, bricks. This x-axis uh, growing season mean temperature. The y-axis uh, Bordeaux uh, overall uh, vintage quality. So as mean sh uh, sugar uh, concentration uh, increases, the Bordeaux uh, overall uh, vintage quality has uh, increased. Likewise, as uh, growing season uh, mean temperature uh, increased, Cabernet and uh, Merlot uh, mean sugar levels uh, increased. It's fairly straightforward, correct? When we compare, uh, you know, Bordeaux to uh, Napa, Bordeaux is in uh, red, Napa is in uh, green. The x-axis uh, growing mean temperature in Celsius and also in uh, degrees Fahrenheit. We see this, uh, you know, uh, graph or that's almost uh, rectangular. Uh, we seem to reach a, a sweet spot here, right around like uh, 18 and a half degrees uh, Celsius. After uh, which point, uh, there's not that much uh, appreciable, uh, you know, gain in the uh, vintage quality index as uh, determined by the uh, you know, Bordeaux uh, uh, winemaker uh, vintage quality report. So the uh, growing season mean temperature of uh, roughly around like uh, 67 degrees Fahrenheit seems to be the uh, sweet spot uh, you know, reaching these uh, you know, uh, ultimate uh, vintage quality uh, indices. However, although temperature is uh, key for uh, this sugar production, uh, we are dealing with a uh, harvest precocity uh, that can also be based on uh, these uh, sudden events that force the uh, decision of uh, making a uh, you know harvest decision by the uh, winemaker or the uh, grower or the uh, farm labor uh, contractor in uh, some cases. So what if it gets uh, warmer? Um, we do have a uh, you know a uh, simmer station uh, at the uh, Oakville station, and uh, everyone says uh, I should uh, remove it. Uh, nobody's using it, but. Uh, if you look at the uh, Department of uh, Water Resources uh, use data, it's the most used uh, station in the uh, whole of uh, CIMIS uh, network. So based on the uh, Santa Lina weather station and uh, Oakville uh, station, we plotted uh, uh, these different uh, scenarios on, uh, based on uh, low emission carbon scenarios, high emission carbon scenarios, and uh, historic uh, measurements of uh, what is uh, being emitted into the uh, atmosphere. It's constantly uh, increasing, and uh, the observed and uh, projected uh, temperatures are uh, constantly uh, increasing in uh, Oakville, uh, uh, Santa Lina region. So as if it's uh, getting uh, warmer, we're seeing uh, addition of uh, water and uh, tartaric acid into the uh, must. 
Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, shade nets uh, yesterday. Uh, Kaolin applications did not necessarily uh, work for us in uh, Oakville. We are looking at uh, uh, breeding efforts for uh, low sugar. Uh, you know, INRA uh, in France and uh, University of Montpellier has these uh, grapes that are, uh, you know, uh, getting 135 to 150 grams per liter of sugar at the ripe stage at the uh, maximum berry volume. And the uh, other disturbing uh, trend we're seeing is, uh, you know, uh, we're, the uh, projections are saying that, uh, you know, there's going to be a 77% uh, increase, right? of the uh, surface area burned annually by the end of the uh, century by these uh, wildfires. You know, we lived through uh, two, uh, you know, uh, fires at the uh, Oakville uh, station. They're uh, quite scary as they, uh, you know, come uh, close to you. And uh, we certainly saw it in uh, Lake County uh, this year. But uh, it's no joke. Uh, you know, things are uh, burning every year now. But anyways, as these are uh, water deficits, uh, temperature uh, differences, they seem to uh, start uh, affecting these uh, secondary metabolites in our uh, grape species. We looked at these uh, different uh, compounds uh, yesterday, disubstituted and uh, uh, trisubstituted. Mainly, uh, you know, we are uh, interested in uh, upregulating uh, this portion of the uh, uh, pathway to uh, end up with a more desirable, uh, stable uh, uh, color, and uh, flavor on all our compounds. And uh, that's what I, you know, majority of the uh, work has uh, focused on in uh, academia, trying to like upregulate these by uh, tricking the plant into uh, making them uh, in a uh, more uh, concentration on compounds. And then the uh, question that we keep getting is like, uh, as these uh, temperatures are getting warmer, as our uh, waters are getting uh, more scarce, uh, the uh, question uh, becomes of like, uh, you know, tannins. How are these uh, going to be uh, managed uh, in the field in light of these uh, projections? Tannins are uh, complex uh, tannins, the ones uh, that we deal with in uh, wine grapes uh, compared to other uh, tannins and uh, other uh, species. And uh, they are not really uh, that responsive to uh, water deficits uh, or uh, uh, light uh, attenuation, uh, as you will see in a little bit on. So we did a lot of uh, work in uh, hot climates. Uh, we looked at uh, different uh, types of uh, leaf removal, times of uh, leaf removal, and uh, different types of uh, applied water amounts. And uh, we, were, we thought uh, we were being smart. We did this work with, uh, in uh, Merlot, because uh, in Merlot, uh, you have a, uh, you know, biosynthesis as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, dehydration and an uh, increase in concentration of these uh, compounds. Well, plants are uh, smarter than uh, us, I guess. Uh, with applied uh, water amounts, when we compared a uh, sustained deficit to a regulated deficit, sustained deficit uh, received about 70% uh, of uh, applied uh, water. Uh, what we saw with a sustained deficit was, uh, you know, just an uh, increase of, uh, you know, uh, berry mass compared to a regulated deficit. With regulated deficit, we just saw a decline in our uh, berry mass. When we compared uh, pre-bloom to uh, post-fruit set uh, leaf removal, we did uh, see some uh, benefits uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, increasing uh, anthocyanins in the uh, hot climate. But uh, we saw, you know, a little bit uh, more uh, interesting stuff with our uh, post fruit set uh, leaf removal. But uh, these were all uh, associated with uh, dehydration, not necessarily uh, biosynthesis. So when we uh, uh, turned the tables on this, uh, you know, research onto uh, Cabernet, uh, which we thought, uh, you know, would be uh, more interesting uh, in these uh, new trellises uh, that we're looking at, uh, we looked at uh, three leaf removals, uh, control, Pre-bloom, post-fruit set, this work is done at the uh, Oakville station. Pre-bloom, uh, it was uh, applied uh, mechanically at uh, 200 growing degree days. Post-fruit set, it was applied at uh, 600 growing degree days. And then uh, on these vines, uh, we applied 25%, uh, 50%, and 100% of our uh, ET crop. Uh, meaning that uh, you know, we applied 100% of the uh, plant demand, 50% of the plant demand, or 25% uh, of the uh, crop demand. Uh, soils are, I know, uh, pretty uh, uniform where we uh, did this uh, uh, work. This was a drip irrigated system. Uh, we applied about, I know, uh, a gallon per hour, and that's what the system was uh, designed for. Uh, pretty common spacing, uh, six by eight uh, spacing uh, in this uh, case. 
And we monitored uh, a lot of uh, things because uh, uh, we're constantly asked by the uh, growers because uh, a lot of uh, services are uh, being sold to them. Uh, we monitored uh, some canopy variables, plant water status, leaf gas exchange, components of field, and uh, berry chemistry. And secondary metabolism, uh, we focused on uh, flavonols, anthocyanins, and uh, proanthocyanidins. And the uh, growing degree the, uh, accumulation uh, at the site uh, was roughly around like uh, 2100 and uh, 2200 uh, growing degree days uh, respectively uh, on uh, Celsius space, uh, you know, approaching our uh, 4000 uh, growing degree days uh, in the uh, Fahrenheit scale. So it's uh, quite warm. So looking at the uh, results, the weather at the experimental site is, uh, you know, uh, quite interesting. Uh, here's day of the year. These are our precipitation and our over the years. And now these are the growing degree day accumulations, our means and the other year and the individual years that we monitored. And then this figure is showing the heat spikes that we're receiving at the site. So 2017 was uh, quite interesting. We, uh, are, we were reaching uh, daytime temperatures in the shade of uh, 117 degrees uh, Fahrenheit consistently and uh, repeatedly. And uh, we had uh, uh, 110 degree temperatures uh, you know, consecutively uh, for about uh, 10 days at uh, Oakville. So you know, I thought I got away from the heat uh, when I moved from uh, Fresno, but looks like I brought it to uh, Napa myself. So looking at the estimated uh, crop coefficient and uh, applied uh, water amounts in uh, Napa, uh, in this figure, this is a uh, day of the year. The y-axis uh, estimated uh, crop coefficient uh, throughout the year. We reach a peak estimated uh, crop uh, coefficient right around like uh, you know 190th uh, day of the year, and uh, after which point uh, you know due to uh, deficits and uh, uh, stresses, uh, these will uh, you know decline a little bit. But uh, we reach an uh, estimated uh, crop coefficient of uh, roughly uh, 0.6 in uh, unstressed uh, vines. And this is uh, very typical for uh, you know, vertically uh, shoot position canopies. The applied water in uh, liters per vine, uh, I have them broken down here uh, from a uh, bud break to a uh, fruit set, fruit set to veraison, and uh, veraison to a uh, harvest. And one good thing about like uh, uh, our region is that uh, you know summer temperatures are you know uh, or uh, summer weather is uh, somewhat uh, you know uh, predictable. Uh, clear open skies. And then uh, these uh, days you know may vary uh, one to two uh, days. Uh, so on average, uh, we have a bud break of uh, Cabernet uh, Clonate on our uh, 110R, roughly around like uh, 9th of April. Fruit set happens uh, 31st of uh, May to uh, 1st of June, and Verizon does not change much. And then uh, we usually have a uh, you know 25 bricks uh, harvest at uh, you know uh, 12 uh, bricks. The plant water status uh, in this case, uh, you know, uh, they separated uh, very well. Uh, you can see the differences in a 25% uh, ET crop, 50% ET crop, and 100% uh, ET crop. The x-axis is, uh, you know, uh, days of the uh, year. This is a uh, stem water uh, potential. So we start off, uh, you know, uh, with uh, unstressed vines, and then, uh, you know, uh, they decline as the uh, year uh, wears on. But the uh, cool thing is that, uh, you know, we're able to uh, maintain the 100% uh, ET uh, at a relatively uh, unstressed uh, stage. And our 50% and our 25% our ET crop are separate uh, very well. Leaf removal uh, treatments in our Oakville did not necessarily uh, affect uh, uh, plant water uh, status when we measured it by our stem water uh, potential. When you look at a canopy uh, microclimate at uh, Verizon, I have uh, two figures here. This is a uh, number of contacts. Uh, at control, pre-bloom, and uh, post-fruit set to see uh, how many uh, uh, leaf layers uh, we have. Uh, this is a uh, leaf on the uh, northeast side of the canopy, leaf on the southwest side of the canopy, and the uh, number of gaps uh, that are uh, opening up in the canopy. This is just a you know, way of uh, you know, showing that uh, you know, the treatments were uh, applied and uh, they're uh, moving uh, dynamically uh, throughout the season. But the uh, uh, funny thing uh, here is that uh, the uh, number of uh, <coughs> uh, contacts, you know, will change as the uh, year wears on. So in this case, uh, the uh, pre-bloom uh, leaf removal treatments, they did uh, close up uh, later on uh, in the uh, season. 
And then uh, we said, uh, you know, this is a vegetative uh, compensation of uh, canopies at a uh, harvest. Uh, leaf removal uh, had a, you know, significant uh, effect. Uh, irrigation did not have an uh, effect, and there was no interaction of these uh, treatments. The, uh, we measured the uh, mass of our uh, lateral shoots at a uh, harvest. So control in our uh, pre-bloom, they had the same number of uh, laterals at our uh, harvest compared to our uh, post-fruit set. So meaning that uh, you know, pre-bloom uh, leaf removal in uh, uh, Oakville uh, was not really uh, that effective uh, keeping the uh, canopies uh, as open uh, compared to our uh, post-fruits that are uh, leaf removal. Bear mass uh, development, you saw this uh, figure a little bit uh, uh, earlier. Uh, I mean, when I say a little bit earlier, uh, yesterday uh, afternoon. Uh, berry mass uh, was not really uh, affected by uh, uh, leaf removal uh, treatments uh, in this uh, warm climate. However, uh, applied water amounts were uh, very effective at uh, you know, controlling uh, berry mass. As expected, 25% uh, uh, ET crop and 50% uh, ET crop uh, uh, reduced the uh, berry mass quite uh, readily compared to 100%. And the uh, amount of uh, carbon uh, we were uh, fixing and the uh, amount of uh, water uh, vapor that we were uh, conducting uh, through these uh, tissues were uh, affected only by the uh, amount of uh, water that we applied. Leaf removal uh, treatments uh, did not uh, affect how much uh, carbon uh, we were fixing in the uh, north coast. So everyone uh, asked us uh, about the yield. Everyone's talking about uh, you know, big quality gain, but uh, you know, everyone's uh, also interested in uh, yield. So uh, we've been uh, doing this work for uh, quite a while now, and uh, everyone is saying that, uh, everyone uh, kept telling us that uh, you know, pre-bloom uh, leaf removal uh, will reduce the uh, number of uh, berries per cluster uh, you set. Well, up and down uh, California and the uh, warm climate uh, regions, we do not see uh, an effect of uh, leaf removal on the uh, number of uh, berries set. And this uh, reveals itself in the uh, number of uh, berries per cluster at a uh, harvest. Number of uh, clusters per vine, of course, is not going to be affected. And then uh, yield is not going to be affected by uh, yield in the uh, hot and uh, warm climates of uh, California. Conversely, applied uh, water amounts are uh, going to be uh, you know, more effective in uh, controlling yield uh, in these uh, hot climates. Of course, uh, you throw the uh, plant water demand, you're going to uh, you know, optimize uh, yields. If I drop it to a uh, 50% of water demand, still I get the uh, same yield. So the uh, trick is to uh, you know, be somewhere between uh, 50 to 100% of uh, crop demand. And we usually have uh, settled at 65% uh, of uh, crop demand to, to uh, build in that uh, you know, little bit of uh, 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 insurance. But 25% uh, of uh, uh, crop demand uh, water replacement uh, reduces uh, our yields by about uh, you know, 30%. So, but we have known that uh, for a long time. So vine balance is a big topic. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, later on. Uh, throughout the uh, week, the ideal ranges are uh, between uh, 4 to uh, 13 uh, uh, fruit weight to a uh, pruning weight uh, ratio. And uh, this depends on uh, you know, what cultivar, what region uh, you're in. Uh, southerly uh, regions in uh, Kern County, Fresno, uh, Madera, we can probably go up to a uh, 13 of a uh, uh, crop load index. But the interesting thing uh, we saw with our uh, leaf removal uh, trials and our uh, irrigation trials here, this is an uh, interaction graph of uh, leaf removal treatments and water application treatments. With pre-bloom uh, treatment, as we uh, you know, uh, increased the applied uh, water amounts, uh, we were uh, invigorating the uh, vine, meaning that uh, we have a higher uh, crop load uh, index. Conversely, with our post-fruit set, we were uh, devigorating them by uh, applying uh, more water uh, amounts. Berry chemistry. Uh, first, we're looking at uh, bricks. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, uh, applied water amounts were uh, more effective. Leaf removal uh, did not really uh, affect uh, any of the uh, berry chemistry in uh, Oakville. When we look at uh, anthocyanin uh, content and concentration at a uh, harvest, when we look at uh, content, uh, irrigation treatments uh, did not uh, affect it with uh, Cabernet. Likewise, uh, leaf removal had no uh, effect with uh, Cabernet. When I look at uh, fat, total anthocyanins based on uh, fresh mass at our uh, concentration, I can see that uh, you know, uh, reducing the applied uh, water amounts concentrated the uh, anthocyanin uh, concentration in our uh, Cabernet, but again, our uh, leaf removal uh, had no uh, effect. 
Here's a look at the kinetic development of uh, anthocyanins at uh, Oakville and their uh, concentration. X-axis is uh, date, Y-axis is uh, total anthocyanin, uh, milligram per gram of uh, fresh berry mass. 25% of our ET crop, 50% of our ET crop, 100% of our ET crop. The highest concentration of our anthocyanins is uh, achieved with a, you know, 25% of our uh, crop replacement for our water. Uh, 50 and 100% were not uh, different uh, in this case. Leaf removal uh, had no effect on our anthocyanin uh, concentration in uh, Cabernet. When we look at the uh, quality of uh, anthocyanins, the hydroxylation uh, ratio, we see the uh, same response where 25% uh, and 50% uh, uh, ET crop replacement uh, gave us the uh, you know, uh, better uh, quality of uh, anthocyanins. Uh, again, uh, there was no uh, you know, response from uh, uh, leaf removal for uh, anthocyanins. As we uh, talked about it yesterday, there's a, you know, a relationship between the uh, amount of uh, bricks you make to uh, total uh, anthocyanins, and the uh, relationship uh, becomes uh, more uh, acute here. When we look at the uh, applied uh, water amounts, as we're uh, making uh, uh, sugar uh, faster, as the ripening speed uh, increases uh, with 25% uh, or 50% uh, uh, ET crop uh, water application, we see the uh, response uh, again uh, from uh, bricks to uh, anthocyanin uh, uh, regression uh, here, but likewise, uh, conversely, uh, there's no uh, relationship between uh, bricks and uh, anthocyanins and uh, leaf removal in uh, Cabernet Sauvignon in uh, uh, our conditions. Results were a little bit uh, more uh, encouraging with uh, flavonols as we uh, exposed them uh, to uh, more light early or uh, later in the season, we made uh, more uh, flavonol uh, content uh, in the berry. Likewise, uh, the concentration uh, also uh, increased. As we uh, exposed them more, uh, we had uh, more uh, trihydroxylated uh, uh, flavonols uh, in this uh, system. Now, when we look at uh, proanthocyanin uh, content and uh, concentration, we do not see a whole lot of uh, stuff uh, going on, uh, either with uh, you know, uh, applied uh, water amounts and uh, leaf removal. Here's uh, total tannins and uh, milligrams per berry. We would not necessarily call this uh, statistically significant. Here's uh, total proanthocyanin uh, milligrams per berry. Uh, applied water amounts did not change. Uh, content or uh, concentration, and our uh, leaf removal uh, had uh, no effect on our uh, uh, tannins. But when we uh, divided them uh, up into, its, uh, into their uh, extension and uh, terminal uh, subunits, we started seeing a little bit of uh, differences, but uh, it was mostly, uh, again, with the uh, applied uh, water amounts, with very uh, similar to the uh, uh, Merlot work uh, we did in the uh, San Joaquin Valley. Mean degree of uh, polymerization, uh, a rough measure of uh, astringency in the uh, berry skins. Again, uh, these were not uh, affected uh, either by uh, leaf removal or uh, applied uh, water amounts. So tannins are, uh, you know, essentially a time capsule of, uh, you know, uh, ripening, how palatable uh, they become uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the berry uh, ripens. So as we uh, look at this, we see a shift in climate in uh, California's uh, north coast uh, AVAs. We have a little to a no cloud cover. We have a intermittent uh, heat spikes. We have a general uh, warming trend. And uh, we do not see an uh, increase in our uh, precipitation uh, supply, but you know, today uh, is uh, proving us uh, wrong. But growing degree days are like, uh, you know, constantly uh, increasing. And we saw this uh, figure uh, yesterday. We are seeing a shift towards a uh, position in our uh, sprawling systems. But, uh, you know, again, uh, as the uh, road direction uh, changes, the uh, response uh, you get from these uh, uh, trellis uh, systems are uh, different. So this is the uh, system uh, that's most common in uh, Oakville, Yountville uh, area, sometimes uh, in the uh, Monterey uh, Peninsula. So this makes a 60-degree uh, angle uh, in between the, uh, uh, these cross arms that uh, will make a 60-degree uh, angle. But uh, the idea was to, uh, you know, throw uh, more light into the uh, middle of the canopy, but light is not uh, limiting in uh, California's uh, north coast, especially in the uh, valley floors. So as you uh, throw more light uh, into the uh, middle of this uh, canopy, and then uh, in the afternoon, uh, it uh, heats up uh, tremendously to uh, roughly about 127 degrees uh, Fahrenheit when the uh, 
average uh, daytime temperatures are roughly around like uh, 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Conversely, uh, if you uh, change the uh, road direction, this becomes uh, more uh, equally uh, distributed that the uh, berries uh, do not heat up as fast, as rapidly, or uh, as much as uh, you know, uh, the, uh, this uh, road direction, which is northeast to uh, southwest. So for uh, us, leaf removal uh, timing uh, in the uh, vertically shoot position canopies did not have an uh, effect on our uh, water status, net gas exchange, components of yield. Again, uh, we did not see any effect on our fruit set. So whether you do it uh, early or late in our warm climate, uh, it's not affecting our fruit set. And we did not see an uh, effect on our primary metabolites. We do see uh, more effects of uh, applied water mouse in California. Water status is different. Net gas exchange is different. Components of yields is dif different. And as far as primary metabolites, ripening uh, speed uh, changes. So if you were to uh, look at this, when we look at our water deficits, there's severity, time and duration. We mostly see an uh, indirect effect with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon under uh, these uh, warming climates. It's an uh, indirect effect, berry mass declines, ratio of uh, skin to pulp ratio increases. So we see an increase in our uh, concentration of uh, anthocyanins and flavonols, uh, somewhat of a minor effect on our proanthocyanins. But uh, in these uh, highly managed uh, VSP canopies, we did not see a modification of the uh, canopy ameliorated uh, fruits on exposure, and uh, we did not see uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, flavonol uh, biosynthesis. We did not see any direct effects of our uh, water deficits in our uh, Cabernet in these uh, uh, VSP uh, canopies. With canopy manipulation, leaf removal uh, specifically, whether you do the early or late, um, we do see an uh, effect of our uh, light and temperature. We do see an uh, effect on our biosynthesis of our anthocyanins, but uh, it's not a biosynthesis uh, increase. Uh, we do not see a huge impact of our uh, light. Uh, we see an impact of our uh, light on our flavonols, and uh, this might uh, you know, uh, have a uh, little bit of an uh, effect on the uh, astringency. So cluster uh, microclimate uh, without leaf removal in these uh, VSP canopies in the uh, north coast of California is uh, already uh, optimized uh, according to uh, what we're uh, able to uh, measure. You have clear skies, long periods with uh, minimal precipitation, coupled with uh, irrigation restriction. These have a stronger effect than canopy manipulation such as shoot or uh, leaf removal. An optimal uh, ET crop replacement is uh, roughly around uh, 50 to uh, 60 percent, and uh, this is usually uh, achieved by uh, sustained uh, deficits. Although not as impactful, there seems to be an interest from our producers to understand the impact of our leaf removal practices on our further our bear physiology, more so than uh, you know, uh, understanding uh, the effects on our uh, plant protection, because you do you are able to get a uh, better uh, spray material uh, into this uh, system. So that's all I have uh, for this. And, uh, we do have some time for uh, questions before I turn it over to uh, Andy Walker. Uh, we worked a lot with uh, regulated uh, deficit uh, irrigation. Uh, uh, if you are going to do a uh, regulated deficit uh, irrigation in uh, warm climates, uh, we found that uh, you know between a uh, fruit set uh, between our uh, bud break and our uh, fruit set, there should be a little uh, restriction of our uh, applied uh, water amount. So in our case, uh, you know, 65% is uh, optimized. Anything more than that, uh, your you know, water uh, washes away. Between our uh, fruit set and our uh, Verizon, we dropped it to, uh, you know, uh, 50 to 30% uh, of our uh, ET crop uh, replacement. It did not necessarily change set, but it does uh, slow down uh, cell division uh, in the uh, pericarp, so berries are a little bit uh, smaller. Then uh, we would uh, ramp up our application. You know, in our Fresno area, we regularly uh, would put on about uh, 80 to 90% uh, of our ET crop. This region, uh, we go back up to 65% uh, you know, uh, of our ET crop. But again, uh, the uh, amount uh, you will uh, you know, save on our water is not more than uh, you know, uh, two to three uh, acre inches the whole season compared to uh, uh, sustained uh, deficits. I mean, two to three uh, acre inches might not uh, look big to me because I'm working on like you know, one acre uh, max, but uh, you know, for someone that's uh, managing like 30,000 acres, uh, that's a lot. 
So uh, in our warm climates, uh, regulated deficit irrigation, if done correctly, has shown uh, tremendous uh, benefits. So George Zong and I uh, have an experiment uh, in our Fresno County uh, with this with our Cabernet, and our Carl Lund uh, also has an uh, experiment uh, with this uh, uh, also in our Madera County. And uh, we'll be able to uh, taste these uh, wines in uh, May on uh, how these uh, respond. Because I mean, uh, when you crush the grapes, you see the uh, difference between a uh, sustained deficit and a uh, regulated uh, deficit. That two to three uh, acre inches uh, makes a huge effect. And the timing uh, has an uh, effect. But I mean, uh, for uh, us, I mean, uh, we're uh, after like looking at, uh, you know, both biosynthesis of the compound and uh, not reducing uh, yield because, you know, everyone's looking for the uh, trifecta. Save water, make more of the compound, do not lose the uh, yield. But, uh, you know, you cannot uh, do them all. So, John. I mean, the question is, uh, how about uh, the lack of our uh, low temperatures or the occurrence of our uh, low temperatures? So, as climate is changing, uh, it becomes uh, easier to uh, drive to uh, Kern County, which I still love doing, by the way. But, uh, you know, we used to have these uh, horrible fogs. So, that's affecting uh, not only uh, grapes, but also, uh, you know, tree crops as well, uh, peaches, nectarines, uh, almonds. Uh, you know, these are uh, affected by a uh, la lack of fog and uh, these, like, uh, you know, spice and uh, low temperatures uh, as well. Uh, but we haven't, uh, like, tracked the uh, effect of these uh, yet. But, uh, you know, Mark Batney and I uh, put up uh, this uh, inversion station at uh, Oakville, and uh, he might uh, show some of it uh, this afternoon uh, due to uh, rain or talk about it. But, uh, you know, these uh, low temperatures are uh, changing uh, as well. But uh, no, I haven't uh, tracked the effects of these myself. I'm sure someone has. 